Earlier in the same passage, we read this in verse 8. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. Uh, the battle, this is the battle of Gog and Magog. Um, it's a, it's a, a popular uh, trope, I guess we could say, topic, uh, buzzword among um, particularly dispensational uh, theologians. And, and really even going back before dispensationalism, a lot of people would often apply Gog and Magog to their own situations. Um, we, could, we could view this in a kind of I, uh, idealist eschatology where Gog and Magog are these kind of archetypical enemies of God's people and they surround God's people uh, in, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And then God delivers them miraculously and Gog and Magog is destroyed and God's people rejoice. And so you can see that this, uh, going all the way back to the early fathers, I think Ambrose says that Gog are the Goths, the, they're the, the barbarian tribes, right? And uh, you can have uh, guys in the 20th century applying it to Russia, uh, applying it to Iran, Iraq. Uh, there's all kinds of things. And since history is typological uh, and it's typologically related, there's a sense which I'm, I'm okay somewhat with applying these story arcs to our own situations. But I, I do think um, that there is a particular and maybe immediate fulfillment uh, for um, this last day's event. And we're gonna, we're gonna go through Ezekiel today. Uh, we're going to go through Hosea, and then we're also going to go through Daniel, which all mention the last days or the latter days in the reading from the New King James. And my, uh, what, what I am putting forward is that the last days are from the return from ca the Babylonian captivity to the establishment of Christ's kingdom uh, through his first advent and the destruction of Jerusalem. These are really the last days in, in uh, I would say, their primary sense. Um, so uh, Ezekiel 38 through 39 even among most commentators who aren't dispensational, this is an incredibly difficult passage. There's not a whole lot of agreement. A lot of people realize that it seems to be somewhere in that time frame that I just suggested, uh, from the return from Babylon to the establishment of Christ's kingdom. And so some people try to apply it to Antiochus Epiphanes during the, the Maccabees. Um, the Maccabean revolt, but it doesn't really fit very well. And so there's a lot of guessing and shoulder shrugging and really having a hard time to uh, really deal with this passage. And what I would suggest to you, and I'm borrowing heavily from, uh, uh, from James Jordan and Gary DeMar here, um, but the, what I would suggest to you uh, well, let, let me let me let me build it up first. In in the previous chapter, what's the uh, what's happening right before Ezekiel thirty eight? Anybody know? Famous passage with Ezekiel, bringing back the bones. He's bringing the dead bones, and then we're we're told what this is. Uh, we're told that this is bringing uh, bringing Israel in in verse eleven. It says these bones are the house of Israel. We're specifically given the interpretation: the bones are the house of Israel. In verse twelve, he, uh, God says, "I'm going to bring you out of your grave. I'm going to bring you out of death, essentially, and uh, bring you into the land of Israel." So a lot of people realize this time frame is is Israel coming out of Babylon and back into their land. And then at the beginning of Ezekiel 38, we have Persia mentioned. Uh, and then it's, it's strange because we have these uh, nations mentioned, which aren't mentioned throughout the Bible um, really that much, except in Genesis uh, 10, I believe, uh, the table of nations. And they're mainly... Um, they're mainly Japheth. They're from Japheth. Most of the warring that happens with Israel are from Ham and Shem. Uh, these are these are kind of. But then Japheth is really representative of a lot of these uh, 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 a lot of these more foreign types of nations. Uh, Persia being among them. Okay, so let me ask you this: When the Jews come back out of out of captivity, and they are they're back in the land what 
for what Persian force threatens the Jewish people? And then God grants them a miraculous victory. Where does this happen? Um, I, I I don't know if that's connected to this. Where does this happen? I was just guessing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the Book of Esther. It's Haman, uh, and that's what I think Ezekiel thirty-eight and thirty-nine is. It's this it's this apocalyptic version of the Book of Esther, and uh, you might think, well, that's kind of weird because Esther seems so. It, you read it and it seems kind of unremarkable. I mean, it is remarkable, but you know, you have Haman plotting against the Jews and sending out things to all of these provinces, and they're about ready to be destroyed, but then God delivers them, right? And the apocalyptic version, if, we've talked about this before, if you read how um, God delivered David from Saul in Samuel, it's also relatively unremarkable. It's not, but it's not given to us in this apocalyptic form, except when we look at David's account of it in the Psalms, and it's also recorded in Samuel. In Psalm 18, we have the foundations of the earth shaking and, and God uh, bringing down fire and all of these things. And this is similar to Ezekiel 38 uh, and 39. And so I think, uh, I think that's what's going on here uh, with um, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. We do have um, Gog and Magog showing up again in Revelation. Um, which I would I would say is is a, a first century events, and not in our future. Uh, although the the Gog and Magog event does happen after the thousand years, and I'm not I'm not totally sure what that is, but I would say that that's a separate event from Ezekiel 38 and 39. And the reason for that is there's all kinds of Old Testament imagery and names and symbolism that are repurposed for Revelation. Jezebel shows up, but that's not the Jezebel that's in Kings, right? Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned, but that's that's repurposed for uh, Jerusalem, and so I think Gog and Magog. Gog is a separate thing uh, there as well. Another, uh, another aspect that reinforces this is that um, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the word, there's the multitudes are coming against Israel. And that word multitude in Hebrew is um, hemon. It's, and it's used a lot. So the, the hemons are coming against Israel. And uh, when God delivers Israel, uh, we're told in um, chapter 39, the place where the army of Gog is buried will be known as the Valley of Hamon Gog. And then there's a city nearby which will be called Hamona. And we know that God loves wordplay. And I can't help but to view this as a wordplay on Haman. Um, and this is this is associated with Gog throughout uh, throughout um, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. We also have uh, Haman is an Amalekite. We're told that he's an uh, uh, Agag, an, an Agagite, and Agag is was a king of the Amalekites. Josephus says the the Agags, the Agagites, were um, Amalekites. And uh, we have a certain kind of pattern that happens uh, throughout Scripture. Uh, James Jordan calls it the Amalekite pattern. And I'll, I'll simplify it for there's, there's more parts to it. But basically, when God's people come out of Israel, um, we can br bring it back to Abraham. Abraham escapes Pharaoh. There's relative peace. He's attacked by a coalition of nations. And then um, He's, uh, he wins, and then he's blessed by Melchizedek. There's a priest king that, that uh, blesses him, and then God makes the covenant with him and, and promises to build his house, essentially. We have the same thing that happens when Israel comes out of Egypt. They escape Pharaoh. Um, there's relative peace. They're given manna. They, they drink from the rock, the water, They're, and then the Amalekites attack them. And, they, and, uh, and then they win. This is when Moses has his hands, hands up. They win against the Amalekites. And then we have Jethro blessing them uh, after this. And then God making it, establishing the covenant of Sinai with them. And then you fast forward this to David. And David has a similar thing. He escapes the Pharaoh of Saul. He finds 
peace in Ziklag, um, Amalekites attack, they take his wives, he wins, and then he starts, um, he's blessed by a foreign king, the king of Tyre helps him build the house, and then we have God's establishment of the Davidic covenant. And we have the same thing happening here in the restoration era. They come out of Egypt, they come out of Babylon, there's relative peace for a while initially, but then we have this Haman incident, this Esther -is incident, and then uh, God delivers them, and then we have these foreign kings blessing them again. And then the very next chapter of Ezekiel is God establishing the new covenant, and it's seen in terms of a house or a temple, and these are ecclesiastical measurements of the temple, following it after. So this Amalek pattern matches, uh, it matches Ezekiel 38 and 39, matches what happens with Esther. These are just a few, a few things with, uh, with that. And so this is happening in the last days. This is this intertestamental period. It's not really intertestamental. It still is part of the, the Old Testament here. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Hosea. Hosea 3, we read this. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the last days. So there's, there's two things here. There's two times where Israel is, is going without sacrifice or sacred pillar um, for many days. What's, what, what would this be a reference to? What's kind of an obvious reference to this? Captivities, like going to Babylon. Right. They don't have the right. Yeah, they, they're, the temple's destroyed. They don't have any, any sacrifices in that sense. Um, and yeah, so the Babylonian captivity, and then they come out, they, they return. Uh, uh, the Lord their God, David their king, they're seeking him, and they shall fear him in the last days. And so we have... We have this Babylonian captivity to uh, the, the coming of Christ, David, their king. Um, now, there's also another sense in which this could be the current time that we're in. This is uh, Augustine in City of God applies it to the Israelites now, who similarly are in a certain kind of captivity. They don't have... They don't have the sacrifices. They never will. It's never going to be reinstituted. God's never going to let that happen. But when they come back, they'll come back into the church. Augustine says this. Uh, he says, but that those carnal Israelites who are now unwilling to believe in Christ shall afterward believe. That is, their children shall, for they themselves, of course, shall go to their own place by dying. The same prophet testifying, saying, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king. And he goes on and he quotes it. Uh, Who does not see that the Jews are now thus? But let us hear what he adds. And afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And so I just bring this up because this, is, this isn't like wacky dispensationalism. This is Augustine saying the Jews are going to return. There's going to be a, a future return of, of Israel. But... Uh, for our purposes, I, I do believe that this is applied to um, this, this intertestamental period. And, and so we have, uh, I just want to mention a few things with Hosea. Hosea in chapter 1, um, he has to take a wife of harlotry, right? He's this prophet that has to do what God is doing. He has to put up with an unfaithful wife. Prophets are constantly doing this. They're, in, they're doing these wild things that are placing themselves in the position of God. And that's what is happening with Hosea here. And it's, he takes the, the, this wife of harlotry, the children are not his. He names them, not my people, not my children. And Paul applies this language. Uh, th th then in, in chapter one, there's this, um, uh, there's language like, uh, where it was said, you are not my people, you will now be sons of the living God. And Paul takes that language and he applies it to the church. He applies it to the Gentiles in, in Romans 9. And we see similar things in uh, Hosea 2. Uh, he says uh, that there's charges brought to the harlot mo mother and God says, uh, you are not my wife. 
I am not your husband. And then he says, but I will make you my wife. I will betroth you to me forever. And then we start having new covenant language in that day. Hosea starts talking about a day and, and he's like in that day, I believe is a reference to the last days to the coming of Christ. I will make a new covenant with, he's making a new covenant with all of creation. He talks about basically the revamping of creation. He's the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth. It's a new creation. Um, he, there's, he says, I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. And Paul applies this in Romans to the church, to the Gentiles. And in, in Hosea 3, the Lord tells Hosea to, to purchase Gomer uh, to purchase this woman of harlotry, and they make an agreement to stay faithful uh, to each other for many days. And I believe that this, this uh, could either picture the intertestamental period or the, the new covenant uh, period. Okay, and uh, just a few more things with Hosea. In Hosea 11, uh, we read, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Uh, does that sound familiar? Does anybody... Yeah, right. This is about Jesus. Matthew applies this to Jesus, that he had to go down to Egypt with, with Joseph and Mary, and he comes out. Matthew says, this is a prophecy about Jesus. So again, taking this last day's prophet and, and applying it to uh, New Covenant uh, times. Last thing with Hosea in Hosea 6. Amazingly, I, I don't think this is quoted anywhere in the New Testament. It might be, but this seems to be profoundly new covenantal to me. In Hosea 6, we read this, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. This seems very clearly about the, the crucifixion, resurrection of Christ. So I believe this is more last day stuff, placing it right in uh, uh, the the first century. Does anybody is it does this is this in the New Testament? I don't I don't think it is. I thought it was, but I could, I'm not sure. David, is that is it in the New Testament? I think it is. I'm gonna look it up. Okay, I couldn't find it. Um, but anyway, okay, so let's let's uh, move on to Daniel. I will try to be quick, but let me just say briefly, Daniel is it, it's it's a great book. I've had a hard time with it over the years, but I read through the whole thing and it was it, it was like a, a breath of fresh air. Like there is a lot of revelation coming to Daniel and whereas with the, a lot of the major prophets, these are dark sayings and they're hard to kind of nail down, but Daniel has these visions, has these dreams and these angels come and they say, this is what this means. This is what this means. And Daniel knows what things mean. And, and it's really kind of a breath of, of fresh air. So um, there, the last days are mentioned twice in Daniel 2 and Daniel 10. With Daniel 2, we have this. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the last days. So we have uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're young men taken among the captives of, of Judah, and they're brought into the king's court. They're, they're educated with uh, Chaldean education. The, and and I actually I think that they're actually their Chaldean literature, uh, being familiar with this kind of stuff. I mean, this is made explicit in the text. I think this actually, I think God uses that to help Daniel interpret these dreams. I don't think it's, it's not exhaustive. Of course, there's a supernatural element to it. But I do think understanding these things help Daniel uh, interpret them as well. And so the king has this distressing dream, Nebuchadnezzar, and he has sorcerers and magicians and priests and all these Chaldean men, these wise men. It's funny, they're, they're referred to as wise men, um, but, but they can't. The, the king says, I have a dream. I want you to interpret it. And they're like, tell us the dream. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you the dream. You tell me the dream and then interpret it. And they couldn't do it. But Daniel is able to do it. And he has a vision and he sees what it is. God, God, um, and also Dan, we see Daniel acting as a mediator. And there's so much to this because he's in this pagan 
He's in this pagan like context and he actually acts as this mediator because the king is going to kill everybody because they can't tell him what the dream is. And Daniel says, don't kill these warlocks and witches and sorcerers. He saves them and he says, I will tell you the interpretation of the dream. And, and God reveals it to him. And what he has is the, the picture that I, I gave you guys of this statue that he sees this image and it has this gold head and silver chest and then it has a bronze waist and then the legs and then down to the feet are iron and then it's mixed with soil at the bottom. And Daniel straight up tells him, you are the head, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head. And he talks about the, and then what follows are the successive kingdoms. And there's basic relative agreement. There's some disagreements in some areas um, that the following kingdom is the, the Medo, the, the Medo Persian kingdom. It's the Medes and the Persians had this agreement and they followed after you have Nebuchadnezzar. And then after Nebuchadnezzar, there's possibly, uh, uh, there's one in between. And then I believe his grandson is Belshazzar and Belshazzar is killed. And after Belshazzar, we have Darius and he's, he's, he's a Mede. And then after Darius, we have Cyrus and he's the Persian. And then, and that's the silver. And then the, uh, uh, the bronze is, are the Greeks, and this is Alexander the Great, and then the, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic, and the, there's four kings that fo the kingdoms that follow after that. And then after that is the Roman Empire, and then this is where the debate happens. And then, and then what, and what happens after that? Um, there's a, a, the fourth empire, and then this stone cut without hands comes, and it destroys this kingdom, and it becomes a mountain, and this is, this is the kingdom of Christ. And so um, it, there's, a very natural, there's a very natural suggestion that places this culminating in the first century. Uh, otherwise, you have to put this huge gap between uh, the Roman Empire and then when Christ eventually establishes his kingdom. But it fits very nicely uh, within this, this time frame. Um, and so he tells them this. Uh, oh, and I've had I've had someone ask me um, and it was a very good question, because in my mind, it's like, why is the why? Why is there this kind of um, inferiority as it goes down? Because in my mind, I think of the Roman Empire as being superior to all of these to the Greeks, to the Persians, to the Babylonians. I, I, that's how I would naturally view them. And so I've kind of struggled with this. And there is a sense in which that metal, he talks about it's iron because they're going to destroy everything. It is a tougher kind of metal. Um, this, is, this, is what I, this, is what, this is my take. Uh, take it or leave it. I think God is mocking the, the successive empires. I think he's specifically mocking the Romans where... Think about what happens with Nebuchadnezzar. He, he, he confesses that Daniel's God is the God of gods. He repents in some measure. He falls back and then he kind of comes back. And then we have the Persians or, or we have Darius the Mede. And he was very reluctant to put Daniel in the, in the lion's den. And he says, your God is going to protect you. So he's kind of a repentant kind of believing quasi believer pagan type thing. And then, and then you have the, the, the Greeks, um, and they kind of, Alexander the Great, he leaves the Jews alone, but then following after him, there's persecution with Antiochus. And then you have the Romans that come in, and then particularly the Caesars, the Caesars start exalting themselves as gods. And they start, if we have them on record, Titus says if the Israel, when he's destroying Jerusalem, he says, if, if the Israelite God is so great, let him come out of the sea and fight me. Like you see them exalting themselves against God and saying that we are gods. And a lot of these prophecies show this, that these men are, are blaspheming the God of, of gods. And I, with this vision, I think God is saying, you're, you're dust, you're, you're soil at the feet, at the bottom. That's, that's my take. I think he's mocking. Um, I think he's mocking from Octavian all the way to Nero, uh, these guys who have, have viewed themselves as gods. And, and Jesus comes in and, and destroys their kingdoms, the true God of gods. Uh, the, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this before. The images of Octavian uh, uh, on, the, on the coins say the Son of God on them. 
uh, and so there, he's he's an anti, he is an antichrist in in a sense. Um, okay, uh, so. We have in Daniel 7, he sees these four beasts, and the four beasts correspond to these four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, um, uh, the Greeks, and there's, there's four heads on this like leopard type thing, and those are the, the four kingdoms that come after Alexander the Great. And then there's the, and then the Roman beast, it's a beast that has 10 horns, and we see this in Revelation, and th this, is, this corresponds to Rome as well. And also this fourth beast, in Revelation, we see is like a composite of all four of these beasts, which is what Rome is, right? Rome borrows the Greek gods. It's kind of a, a compilation of all these things. And then we move forward um, in Daniel 8. He sees another vision, and this is the, there's a ram and there's a goat. And this is, he, he's explicitly told this is uh, the Persians and and the Greeks, and the Greeks are going to come in and take them. So we're getting further down the line, and then we get all the way to, um, and, and, and this is also, we're, we're explicitly told, these are the Greeks and the Persians, this happens in history, and we're explicitly told, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Verse uh, 19 in chapter 8, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the, in the last time of the indignation for the appointed time, the end shall be. And then in verse 23, it says, and in the last time of their kingdom, when the transgressors, transgressors have reached their fullness. And this is in the context of talking about Alexander the Great taking over the, the Persian Empire. And then we get to the first year of Darius and uh, Daniel um, has a vision explained to him, uh, uh, moving to Daniel 10. And this is where our, the last one of the last days references, and then we'll move into the new covenant. But it says this, now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the last days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. And what does he do? In, in, in this following in Daniel 11 through 12, the, the rest of the book of Daniel, uh, particularly in chapter 11, the first cha half of chapter 11, almost all commentators are agreed. He's talking about a king of the north and the king of the south, and they're, and they're warring against each other. And these were two of the four kings that came after Alexander the Great. The, the Ptolemaic kingdom to the north, which was basically, they took over Persia, and then the... Um, Oh wait, no, that, that's Egypt. The Ptolemaic kingdom is the kingdom of the south. They take over Egypt. And then the Seleucid empire takes over Persia. And it's, rem it's so remarkably accurate. And, and it's, it's predicting this back and forth of Antiochus invading Egypt and then going back and stealing stuff from uh, the temple and, and going back and then reinvading Egypt. It's so accurate that the higher critics have said that Daniel wrote this after all of this happened because it's so accurate. But then it, what's weird is it, it makes this transition and modern commentators don't note the transition. And what it does is it transitions from the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires and it transitions to the Roman empire. We have, it's, it, there's this, this force coming in from Kittim or Cyprus and it's, it's a representation of the West and that is Rome. Octavian Caesar Augustus, the, the second Caesar or the first depending on how you're counting, the one after Julius Caesar, he comes in and who does, he, who does he defeat? It's a famous battle that kind of establishes the Roman Empire because he, 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 he defeats Egypt and uh, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And it's, it's Cleopatra and, and Mark Anthony. And when Octavian beats them, he establishes the Roman Empire. And this is, um, this is foretold in Daniel. And then I believe this also is difficult because when it's talking about these kings, it's moving quickly through, through many kings. And so it's not static, it is dynamic. And it moves from Octavian and it goes all the way, I believe, to Nero. Um, and, and Daniel ends with Michael 
making war against the beast in all of this. And this is what we see in Revelation. And we can apply this right to the Roman Empire. And so I believe Daniel is going all the way up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Nero dies. There, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. It talks about there's tents. Uh, uh, I wish, I, wish I, I, I had it uh, memorized. But it talks about tents being encamped in Jerusalem. And then the emperor dies. And this is what happens. We have... Vespasian's army is camped around Jerusalem. Nero dies. Vespasian has to go back and then Titus takes over. And this is talked about in chapter 12 of Daniel. So there, I, there, we could spend so much time just being like, hey, this is this and this and is this. But I'm trying to uh, uh, condense this as much as possible. Um, so that is, uh, that is the last of... Um, the last days, uh, <laughs> the last days uh, uh, passages in the Old Testament. Next week, we'll be moving into the, the New Testament, and it becomes even more clear because in the New Testament, it, it's just straight up said many times, uh, this is the last days. And so we have, it's not really speculating anymore. We, we can place these right there um, in the New Testament. So with all three of these, with Ezekiel, Hosea, and uh, Daniel, I believe that we can place all of these things in a, in a partially preterist um, uh, uh, context. So uh, let's go ahead and, and pray. The charge is from the New Testament lectionary reading, and it is this, overflow with hope. Every example that we have of the last days and the coming of the Lord is a restoration, a deliverance of his people, a restoring of them to the land and to himself. And we are brought now into the commonwealth of Israel. In the lectionary reading, it says, uh, rejoice and sing his praises. And how can we not rejoice and sing his praises when he continually delivers his people? He continually takes them out of these seemingly impossible situations, completely surrounded. And it's, it's almost as if he... He multiplies his enemies and, and lures them in so he can destroy them in one fell swoop. And this is what he does over and over again. And that's where we find ourselves again. We find ourselves outnumbered and surrounded. And this is exactly how God wants it. So overflow with hope because he is the God who restores us and who delivers us. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.